Public policy is one of the Harris Center mandates. There was a public policy research center that existed prior to the Harris Center coming into existence at Memorial. And uh, when the Center of Regional Development Studies was established, which I was hired to lead, Dave Vardy, former clerk of executive council, secretary of the cabinet, deputy of fisheries, head of the Marine Institute, amazing guy all around, was the acting head of the Public Policy Research Center. And his first comment to me when I arrived for the new job was, well, I didn't agree with them setting up this new thing. You should make one thing work before you create a new thing. Uh, but he said, you're here now, and it looks like there's a lot of overlap between the mandates, so why don't we merge them? And that led to the creation of the Harris Center. And it's why, though, in the Harris Center is the Leslie Harris Center of Regional Policy and Development. So it's public policy writ large, and then regional development, rural development, urban development. If it relates to Newfoundland, I would the Harris Center plays a role. Um, public policy has had a lot of traction in our work, providing a vehicle for faculty, staff, and students in public presentations, in research, uh, distributed electronically through the Apple. Um, and I think we've had some impact at federal, provincial, municipal, and of course public policy relates to non-governmental, community organizations. But we often have trouble tracking cause and effect. And even when we think we had a definite impact, seldom will a politician or a bureaucrat give you credit. Because of course they came up with it, not us. And that's fine, as long as we can see we're making a difference. But we often have encountered real challenges, and there's lots of discussion and lots of good work within each level of government, on the need for evidence-based decision-making. But when you often see the results of debate, discussion, and what you think is the evidence, some joke, we have evidence-free decision-making. And that's a joke. <laughs> You know, and, and indeed, as we will hear from our two speakers, uh, I have seen evidence, I think, in the last few years, of evidence-defiant decision-making. And so I was ranting on about that at one session, and Peter Warren, totally different background perspective, but some overlapping interests, said almost the exact same stuff, but with different words. And we wanted to make sure we had someone from Memorial. Uh, ironically, and I'll let you two introduce yourselves as you see fit to any more depth, both Peter and Michael worked for the government of Ontario. Steve. Steve. <laughs> I was looking at Michael Everett. <laughs> <laughs> and I am getting old. <laughs> Michael Ignatiev, yeah, that handsome. <laughs> Obvious overlap. <laughs> So I'll let these guys but both bring enormous experience in public policy, as well as in university. <coughs> and uh, I really appreciate them putting together presentations, sharing them with each other, with a little bit of pre-conference uh, discussion. And we're really looking forward to the dialogue in the room as well. So I, that's probably enough for me on why we put the session together. And we see it as contributing to an ongoing debate and development of public policy capacity in this province and hopefully the country, and the role of universities therein. So, uh, Peter's going to go first. The floor is yours. I'm from downtown Toronto, which probably gives me a limited audience, a limited time. <laughs> but let me get it right first. Okay. Uh, I'm actually uh, from downtown Toronto, born and raised there. They're, because I was born there, I don't think it takes so seriously. <laughs> also, I'm a part-time resident of Newfoundland, and I see one of my neighbors, Elaine, here. Um, Hi, Peter. So, um, what I'm going to talk about uh, is from a foundation perspective. Yes, I'm attached, uh, I would currently attached to the Innovation Policy Lab, B of T, but actually my day job is the Lupina Foundation, uh, the Toronto-based foundation that funds the year of health and society, and I'm past chair of the private foundation of Canada, uh, chairman of the board. I'm going to give a funder's perspective. Now, I'll get into some smart-ass economics in addition to that. Uh, but it's all about one proposition. And again, this is the funder's perspective on this whole area of policy dialogue and its background against social innovation. This is the punchline. There has always been a gap between research and policy. 
And if you really want to be heady about it, you can actually go back and debate between Plato and Socrates about the nature of the good and the nature of the perfect. But more importantly, uh, the paradox we know, and I say this from a funder's perspective, because we fund all kinds of this stuff. The funder's perspective, and the, the quiet discussion going on in the foundation leadership in the country now is exactly this proposition. At the exact time, that evidence-based policy has become the very the, uh, the norm globally, it has less and less of an audience. So that's what I want to talk about. Uh, to qualify or disqualify myself, uh, among other things, I used to be chief economist in the province of Ontario, and being the chief economist in government is a great job, because everybody hates you. So <laughs> all of those things that bother you about having a job, like role ambiguity or conflicting <laughs> expectations, no, nah, doesn't exist. So, if you're the chief economist of the province, or the, of the government, uh, the cabinet hates you, because you tell them they can't do stuff. Uh, the taxpayers hate you, because they don't want to pay the taxes to support the services you want. And the teachers are going to hate you just because they hate you. <laughs> so, you come to uh, your job with certain clarity, and a lack of role ambiguity. I say that because what I'm going to talk to you about this morning is going to have some edge to it. Because, it's, uh, as again, this is a funder's perspective. I, muck around in economic DOT, and most of what I was doing muck around. But uh, I deal particularly with the economics of innovation, and that will become relevant. So again, all of what I want to say is that at the exact time, and this is a problem for all of us, problems for funders, for academics, people in the community, at the exact time that evidence-based policy has become the norm, for well, all sorts of reasons we all agree with, it has less and less of an audience. So that's the central proposition I want to talk about. And with that, I wonder how you change the slide. So, there's been a long-term gap between uh, research and policy. You can go to philosophical debate of that, or whatever. From a foundation perspective, uh, the issue is this. Traditionally, foundations uh, engage in support for universities through their capital campaigns, either financial side or building. For the most part, if you take a 75-year perspective, that's what they do. Last 20, 20 years have seen foundations more actively involved in scholarship, which has been pluses and minuses. If you looked at foundations 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, I'll show you my um, there was a kind of way that foundations in Canada didn't fund that much direct research on the front end. It funded pilots, it funded uh, evaluation studies, that sort of activity. And that took place in an area where there was a sort of a consensus and a shared framework. That in, as a direct phrase, and speaking directly, uh, foundations were looked upon uh, as funding pilots. And if the pilots bear fruit, subject evaluation, that fed into the pilot policy dialogue. And then ultimately, uh, there was uh, policy decisions that affirmed what worked. So we shared a fairly stable and linear innovation model in that sense. That's now hit a framework. All right. So as I said, we had kind of a consensus on where the boundaries were and how the system worked. Um, uh, and that has now become problematic. Become problematic, one, just to uh, reiterate the, the consensus in the 70s, there's this linear model of change where you had research front end, you had initial policy dialogue that led to pilots, pilot projects, evaluation, policy development, and a monthly cabinet decisions. Now, some of the great political minds of our time uh, have, uh, this is really embarrassing. I got to a big economics conference in Kansas City last week, other than dodging tornadoes, and I, I walk into the cocktail party. I don't know anybody in the front end. Like one guy from Harvard, one guy from Berkeley, another guy from Texas. I said, I'll say I'm from the UT. Well, you got the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the important thing here. From a Danny Williams to Stephen Harper to a the inestimable mayor of Toronto, Rob Ford, they're actually saying no. They are actually are not interested in policy dialogue. And if we think that's just a matter of personality, if we think that's just a matter of ideology, we miss a strategic point. And this is what the foundation uh, leadership is currently preoccupied, if I can 
speak somewhat uh, beyond, uh, well, I'll speak directly to you about it. There's actually a political theory behind it. It's not just personality, it's not just style, and it's not just ideology. It may have all those attributes. But my take on these issues we're trying to talk about, it actually goes with these birds actually have a, a theory. So it's a change in the mid 80s, uh, of, of the mid 2000s. There was a new era of uh, ideological uh, politics under a neoconservative neo uh, banner, but also this growing government uh, disinterest uh, in policy. Just a straight disinterest. And if you look at where the cuts come, almost universally, as a former slave of the Treasury in Toronto, the first cuts come from policy shops. So they annihilate the policy shops. Partly because the cabinet isn't interested. The Harris government uh, uh, in Ontario, no matter how accomplished the academic researchers might be, or the methodologies, uh, they actually weren't interested in the impact of their, on distribution of income, welfare folks, immigrants, blah, blah, blah. They actually just weren't interested. That is now formalized uh, in a more uh, direct way that we have to think about it. Because I think it changes what we do and how we do it. The austerity agenda and the funding cuts are there, and they continue to, um, they continue, uh, to play out. Uh, but it's the game changer. So what we actually have is a new theory of politics and the state, i.e., what is it the government does? That's the challenging thing that we actually, together, have to think about. From the foundation, uh, yeah, we've got lots of money. Uh, but if our academic and social partners aren't, aren't thriving, we can't be successful. It doesn't matter money, it's actually about ethics. So, what does that mean? One, there is an active disinterest, uh, uh, active disinterest in new policy development. The austerity uh, 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 developments, uh, which I think are not going to get us to economic recovery. Uh, you clearly hit the, the social limits of that in, in Europe. But austerity is going to be with us. Partly, we are only halfway through, gang, the, the aftermath of the financial crisis. And we may not be happy. We'll have recovery. Recovery in Newfoundland, recovery in Alberta probably takes five years. Recovery in the United States probably five years. Uh, Ontario's probably ten. Uh, and uh, I used to be chief economist in the place. UK is probably ten, and God knows in, in Europe. So the austerity budget will just continue to, to grind on. And one of the impacts of that is what happens to the policy capacity of government when they're in fact being largely eliminated. What are the capacities of universities? Our foundation, which is my wife Margaret now, we funded 150 doctoral postdoctoral doctor fellowships in the last 10 years. We have a lot of skin in the game. And most of those, given the nature of the issues we did, are in the humanities and social sciences. But if you look at that as a labor market, if you took the footprint of, of uh, sure, there is a job churn of 700 jobs in quote normal time. There is a job turn around 700 in, across uh, the country, Canadian universities, and the humanities and social sciences. New jobs, retirements, replacements, promotions, about 700. For the next five years, only 250 of those are going to be replaced across the country. So one of our problems, I mean, there's lots of stories. You know, one of our problems with the funders, how do we, all these uh, young people who have a lot of money, in, how, how are they able to succeed? It's a real problem. And while I'm entirely on side with the discussions going on here in the conference about the protocols for uh, tenure promotion, like 150 years ago when I was at, at Waterloo, I'm, I'm the only person who planned that. I four degrees in Waterloo and another degree at MIT, all in different subjects. <laughs> I never found anything I was particularly good at. Uh, but at Waterloo, where David Johnson comes from, uh, 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 35 years ago, uh, you didn't get credit in tenure for patents in, in, in natural sciences or engineering. Didn't you? you sure do now. So what we said to the uh, university presidents five years ago is, we're not trying to run the university, we've got enough problems in our life. But you guys have to find a way on the social side to say, what is the equivalent of patent? Mm -hmm. 
get credit in, in tenure. Because for foundations, we fund applied research and policy-related research. It doesn't have to be in every footnote. No? It doesn't have to be on every page. But that's what the business we're in. Okay? That's the stuff that we do. And there isn't credit on that side of the house. Partly because if you're a young uh, uh, scholar working in uh, one of these areas of innovative stuff, she probably can't get published. God helps you remember the American Economics Review. Can't get pu you're publishing secondary journals. Maybe that's the only space you get access to. Applied research journals, policy journals are not the top tier journals of tenure. Period. So that would be to use that as an example. So whatever you're going to do in the system, okay, you have to find on the social side something equivalent that you do in the engineering and the hard sciences side in patenting that kind of stuff. Uh, we're going to resume this, some of that discussion with the university fellows. And that's important because um, our folks have to succeed long term. All these young people, they have to be able to succeed. If, to, if something doesn't change, that system can't succeed. That's now rapidly, that issue has been around several years. That's, and Guelph and Memorial have been taking the lead in the, in the country on that. And there's the AFC's community, slow progress in what's happening. I'm afraid that the austerity impacts on the job market uh, uh, have a greater impact. On the social side, the impact, the most pernicious impact of the uh, uh, austerity is, you could say theoretically, big austerity problem, it's the greatest moment around for having the, the most profound policy debate, because you're down to fundamental choices. I'm afraid that largely isn't true. My observation is we've largely set off a war against, war, war against all against all over funding. Everyone's chasing the envelope, and it's not a particularly friendly thing. In addition to that, if we are honest with ourselves, particularly in your uh, austerity, the actual innovative capacity of community-based organizations and voluntary sector in Canada is probably a single digit and shrinking. So you're losing an audience, capacity participating. You're losing an audience, fundamentally, at the uh, uh, government side, because of the great the minds of our time. Uh, you're losing uh, capacity in terms of people, young people being able to succeed in the system. And you're also got constricted capacity in the uh, in the um, in the uh, community sector as a whole. What does that mean then? There is this new theory. These guys actually have a theory. And that is that government is actually in the business of decisions. What government does is make decisions. It does not make policy. Okay. That's that's the issue that's uh, going on. From the Ford administration, I mean, I'm not saying these guys sit up reading platonic texts. Well. <laughs> A certain stimulus of me. And that camera off. Anyway, what, you know, what that is, there, there is a theory behind it. Okay? Is, and actually, uh, 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 the deputies in Ottawa know it. And you get underneath the politics and you actually find out. Okay? But actually, they'll say, okay, we are actually not in the business of making policy, we make decisions. What that means is the paradox at the very time, that is the fundamental. Uh, uh, issue for me. That at the very time that evidence based policy making is normal, there's less of an uh, audience. The reply from those great political minds is we have values, we were elected, and we decide. We are actually not into Socratic dialogue about policy. Governments make decisions, not policy. Now, like most big ideas, it might be right. they might be right. They might be right. It actually requires some serious political theory, political science reflection here, philosophical reflection. But actually, they're in the business. At the end of the day, governments decide. And as a former deputy minister, I would say that sounds right. Feels right. Uh, I've been working a lot. But that's the question that the senior foundation leadership is in Canada is currently noodling for, if you want to know what's going on in the funder side. What that means is uh, we've moved from this linear model of policy dialogue, including the research to pilots to evaluations to uh, policy formulation to decisions. We're moving into, they may have done us a service, hard knows that it is, of uh, moving to a nonlinear uh, uh, model of policy change. 
i.e. it looks like that. It doesn't look like the linear uh, socratic model. And that's the world of nonlinear change that uh, both of us, well all of us, community folks, academic folks, foundation folks have to, have to be thinking about. Try to put the, the implications, we have to rethink the policy model. We have the nonlinear dynamics of, uh, of uh, social policy. Review of the uh, uh, university incentives and all that tenure promotion uh, work going on. And a new kind of interactive interface between uh, research and uh, community. So what might a, um, a uh, revision in the interface and within the policy process? One, you have a new generation of researchers with new incentives and supports from the university. And innovation and foundations uh, increasingly are looking to innovation policy labs. Innovation policy labs, I'll use two examples from our foundation. Innovation policy labs are different from traditional foundation funding things uh, in this way, that the uh, foundation is motivated by a policy proposition that they want to explore. All right. Two examples. Uh, one example uh, where for our foundation the policy proposition we want to test is called frugal innovation. There's a lot of academic bump behind that at the Innovation Policy Lab at the local center. Frugal innovation. That is, most of the research we do across the system is founded on relatively high resource societies. <coughs> practical example. We've been involved for the last 12 years, a lot of work in bombings. Uh, it grows out of the Omaha bombing in, in uh, Northern Ireland, showing my Catholic roots. Uh, particularly vicious bombing, because it's a dissident faction of the IRA blowing up a bomb in a Catholic town to undermine the peace process. And for years, the IRA and the uh, US, uh, British Army had a secret set of codes to distinguish real from phony threats. They used the codes in this case to hurt the people towards the bomb. So we got in there with the Department of Psychiatry uh, in the OMA, uh, uh, in the OMA uh, uh, within a week, uh, developed a protocol for having, uh, for intervening in mass community trauma, which is a particular phenomenon. And other folks got interested in that. So we've been supporting a network of clinicians, Northern Ireland, UK, Israel, Palestine, Sri Lanka. Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is a rich country with the NHS. Well, how do you implement those or either use those protocols or interventions in societies that don't have those resources? Okay. So currently we're testing that as, uh, well, we're up to our ears in organizing intervention in Syria uh, to you in, in the refugee camps using smartphones to do re uh, remote PTSD uh, interventions. The policy proposition for the foundation is how do we deal with uh, 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 development of, of, of frugal innovation, i.e. interventions that, that may have come from rich societies. How do you do that when you have low high need, low resource, uh, high need, uh, uh, low resource societies? So currently that gets us into Syria. Another one, uh, the policy proposition that, the uh, second lab we're running, is a policy proposition that involves global knowledge networks and health, uh, which in this case is Canada, China, and back to North America. Um, we've been, when everybody was writing about bird flu, um, <coughs> so eight years ago, Margaret and I decided to do something about it, so we identified the University of China that's the leader of world health, so we've been in China working. More recently, uh, uh, that started about, there's a health reform in China that's in world historic terms probably more important than, than the Americans. Obamacare and important for the world. I mean, this simply decided that uh, if, unless you could strengthen the health system in rural China, you couldn't contain the stuff upstream. Um, my outside mind for my PhD is in Chinese history, but decisions you make when you're trying to. Um, so, we've been in China for seven years, and diabetes is now, the World Health Organization is freaked out because diabetes is the issue that could overwhelm the whole Western European and North American health system. Secondly, there's modeling that we help support that identifies a unique problem that's freaked out the World Health Organization. That is, rising living standards in East Asia, changes in diet, 
growth of uh, obesity, diabetes, and with entrenched cultures of smoking, because uh, diabetes compromises the, uh, the uh, immune system. You unleash a, uh, a tsunami of drug-resistant uh, tuberculosis for about eight to 10 years from now. Well, in our former modest way to start getting taught us. So what we're doing is we developed, uh, we did our work in China, we just finished a three-year thing in, in, uh, in uh, Hefei, uh, Anhui province, uh, 300 miles west of Shanghai. Uh, and uh, we got the uh, set of relationships with public health and the university, uh, all the way medical university, and we got pretty up to date on what's going on with the thing. What we're going to do is we support, uh, supported monthly lobbying work in northern Saskatchewan. Uh, in order, you've got the precursor of the global problem in, in particularly young native women with obesity and uh, diabetes problems and uh, uh, tuberculosis on the reserves. So we've developed certain models for that, uh, computer simulation models, but also a set of smartphone apps. So what we're going to do this fall is take this, because smartphone uh, apps uh, uh, are growing like this in North China. So we're going to take that all out to China uh, this fall in a, in a lab that will install that in China. And the nature of the apps, as well as you reprogram this, all those fancy stuff we like to do, uh, the smartphone, GPS, uh, is actually a set of very powerful six or seven uh, sensors. So we reprogram the sensors, as well as the apps, to do data capture. And we can do diet, compliance with uh, uh, you know, drugs, uh, diet, social networking, physical movement, that sort of uh, thing, and generates Two million data points per person per month. So we want to use those new. So using the cell phones in rural China, uh, we'll get, generate these micro data sets of two million data points per person per month, and we can believe we can use that as the uh, the computational infrastructure for new kinds of diabetes interventions and self management. And then we will bring that back to North America. That includes the convention system. So. Um, that's what we're trying to do. So, uh, foundation's trying to push on this problem of the gap between research and policy. Uh, in addition to other support we've had for uh, scholarship, we decided to actually push into this area by running our own policy maps, where the foundation itself and its partners bring certain policy propositions. So we've got two running uh, currently, another on the drawing boards, one on, as I said, uh, frugal innovation, once we get this into the Syrian refugee camps. The secondly, the global circulation of health knowledge, predict from the third world to the first, because it's in the China and diabetes. So, what we actually have underneath this, finally, is a new geography of, of social innovation. I'm concerned, from both hats I wear, that when people talk about social innovation, when talk about health innovation, there's no connection between that and talk about innovation in, in the broader economy. Uh, predictably, economists have little to contribute to that. Economic geographers do. If we look at that literature, that literature is about place, but my friends, place isn't the same as identity politics. So when I listen to this conference, I'm doing keyword searches in my mind around place and how people talk about place. Doing secondly, modularity, i.e., if you're Gates Foundation, biggest foundation on the block, by the way, they are making all their bets in terms of the scalability. But scalability fundamentally turns out modularization to be successful. And finally, this whole business of the knowledge interfaces, to use clumsy language, we'll get to the language. In, in the economics literature, it's ex, uh, the uh, words that are used are, are um, boundary objects, stated more understandably as generative metaphors. That is, in the university community interface, you have an interface using traditional language between codified knowledge and passive knowledge. And there's lots of actually interesting work on how those interfaces take place. And they generate over time what's technically called in sociology family realities, but more understandably as generated metaphors. And I don't hear, well, I agree with all the sentiments about participation, community engagement, all that sort of stuff. Unless you're, you want to be hard nosed about the methodology, uh, um, then you have to actually talk about boundary objects and you have to talk about general that's what will move the ball forward. There won't be a whole bunch of folks liking each other. I love you all, but that I won't do. Okay? 
from methodological things, place, modularity, and generative metaphors, or let's call it the boundary object. That's the kind of language we're um, going to have to share with people. And those are all the reasons why people hate me. Keep the comments together. <laughs>
but we're kind of rare birds. And even there, uh, there occurs the phenomenon that I would describe as border crossing. When you change hats, you also, to a certain extent, change heads. I can remember when I went from being a professor and associate dean at McGill to being assistant deputy minister in the government of Ontario and started talking to researchers who wanted uh, me to fund their research. I suddenly knew more than they did. Uh, it's in fact somewhat dangerous to be the chief economist because uh, you know an enormous amount and the people you're dealing with out in the university, you are now allowed, partly because your PhD is fancier than their PhD, uh, to condescend to them. So the overlap isn't as useful as it might be, but it would still be helpful, and there isn't much of it. Uh, I'm talking to you about my experience as the director, founding director, actually, of the Center for Applied Health Research, which is uh, a research unit at Memorial University. It's part of the university with a multi-faculty mandate, but it's uh, managed financially and bureaucratically by the Faculty of Medicine. But it's largely funded by the Department of Health and Community Services. That is, the policy makers, the decision makers. And as I told you, uh, our mandate is triple, but the crucial thing is to increase the use of evidence in decision making and policy making. Um, when, we start, when I started this center after getting it rolling, which took a couple of years, I sat down to try to figure out how I could do that interface between researchers and the decision makers who were funding me. And I tried a whole bunch of things that did not work. Uh, some didn't work very loudly, some didn't work somewhat less loudly, but they really didn't work. So the first thing I tried was what we called commissioned research. We took a piece of our granting budget and said to the Deputy Minister of Health and the CEOs of what at the time were the 14 health boards, regional health authorities in the province, okay, you can use this money to fund research on topics that you're interested in. So we will put out a call, a request for proposals to the academic community. They'll propose a bunch of topics that they would do research on and you get to pick. Well, that was a disaster. Uh, they didn't really care. They had no criteria for deciding. They Picked, they told me to fund topics that were really not very smart. Um, it just didn't work. We funded nine research projects. None of them ended up informing policy in any significant way. Um, so we tried something else. We partnered, which is a word I learned to use once I got into this business. We partnered <laughs> with a health research foundation, a funder, called CHSRF, the Canadian Health Services Research Foundation. Uh, and they were interested in this evidence to policy network, Nexus. And they developed a questionnaire for decision makers, asking them about the way they used policy, read about policy, got informed about policy, what they knew, what they didn't know, what they thought would be useful. So we took their questionnaire, and we got the Deputy Minister of Health, who was really quite supportive, um, to administer it to his staff, and to hold meetings at which they filled out the questionnaire, discussed the results, and we held tutorials for them on how things could change. Well, that was, that was an amusing exercise, but it didn't get us anywhere. Um, it got us somewhere that also didn't work, which is this special seminar series thing. Uh, for about two years, once every three months, we would have a guest speaker, either internally from Memorial or from outside the province, we would fund to come in and give a seminar for senior policymakers in the Department of Health and Community Services. Um, didn't go anywhere. Uh, some of them were quite good talks, but they didn't produce anything in the way of policy sensitivity, new language for discussing policy, or 
changes of mind about decisions that were being implemented. And then we did a series of training sessions on health technology assessment. Health technology assessment is a specialized field in which one does systematic reviews, careful syntheses of all the evidence on a new or an old health technology like a drug or a medical device like a stent to see what the science says about whether it works or not and whether it's cost efficient. Uh, and what I discovered when I started getting brochures from the Canadian agency that does this stuff, which is called the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology in Health, CADIF, um, that I was taking the reports and putting them on the shelf rather than reading them. So I figured the decision makers must be doing the same thing, so I asked them, and it turns out it was true. Many of them got these brochures, they looked at them very briefly, filed them, never looked at them. So we organized a set of training sessions to teach people in senior government positions in the Department of Health how to read these reports and use them. And that didn't produce anything substantial, except it led to the thing I'm about to talk to you about, which is CRISP. Uh, which I refer to up there uh, rather sardonically as a better mousetrap. Uh, it's in a way a mousetrap because it gets decision makers into a room and doesn't let them out until they do something. Uh, and it's a better mousetrap in that it actually works to get evidence into policy somewhat. And the idea came to me during a discussion at the end of one of these training sessions on health technology assessment that I just mentioned in which people kept on saying, well, you know, that, that, the stuff in that report, because we gave them some sample work, that's very clever, but that doesn't apply to us. We can't do that. We can't afford to do that. We don't have the resources. The geography of this province is so complicated and so different from the places where that, all that research was done that we just are not going to pay attention to that. Why don't we have our own agency that would do these uh, reviews of health technology. Uh, and I said, you know, that's not going to work. You can't afford that. Those things cost millions of dollars. What we need to do is something simpler. That is, we need to take all the reports done elsewhere, let them spend the money, bring the reports here, bring the results all together, synthesize them, but synthesize them for you. That is, to tell the decision makers, Here's what this means for Newfoundland and Labrador, or for this region of Newfoundland and Labrador, or for this population group in this province, because they're making the decisions, you need to talk to them. So we cooked up the program called CRISP, where the crucial letters are the C and the S. S is synthesis. We don't do new research, we synthesize existing research. And the C for contextualized. We take the research and we tailor it for the people we're talking to. It is not generic research that says this is what the science says about the way the world works. It is contextualized research that says this is what the science says will and won't work for you here in Newfoundland at this particular moment. Uh, so we cooked up a process in which every year we sit down with the five key decision makers in the health system, that is the Deputy Minister of Health and the four CEOs of the Regional Health Authority. So there are five key leaders and some of their key staff. And we get them to pick topics. And we say to them, find questions where you know you're going to have to make a new policy or to use Peter's more realistic language, a decision in the next year and on which you think you would like to know what the science says. If you already know what you're going to do, if you already know that the political pressure is so overwhelming that no matter what the science says you're not going to do it, don't ask us to find out what the science says. But if you're not sure what you're going to do, if you would like to know what the science says, we'll tell you. And we give them Within six months, we give them a 30-page report, a 40-page report. These things are growing, they get bigger and bigger. Or within 30 business days, we give them a, a short report, which we call a uh, 
Rapid Evidence Review, an RER. And we do about five or six of these a year. Uh, I'm not going to read all this out to you, but here is a list, a li a list. Here is a list of the studies we have already done. And you can see that some of them are about health technologies. Some of them are about health service provision. Some of them are about the way to organize medical services. Uh, but they're all about how to do it in one place at one time. They're all contextualized. Here are the projects we're currently working on. Actually, we just finished the flu vaccination one. Uh, it's a very controversial subject uh, because it's clear that voluntary programs to get healthcare workers to get vaccinated for the flu don't work. Uh, it's almost impossible to go over about 60% adherence, and 60% is not good enough in a flu epidemic. Epidemic. If only 60% of the nurses and doctors and cleaners in a hospital had been vaccinated for the flu, you will get an epidemic in your hospital. Uh, so the question is, uh, can you do mandatory ones? And what happens if you do? We did a study. Uh, what we do with all of these studies is we form a team that includes both people from my shop and a senior scientist from somewhere else in North America uh, that is a, re a recognized expert on the topic. One of the five key leaders, some of his or her staff and local researchers, so a team of 10 or 12 people, and we produce a study. <coughs> Uh, projects we're going to be working on uh, include diabetes screening and how best to do it. So uh, clearly they know, as you do, that diabetes is the problem of the decade. Uh, we're going to be talk doing a study on how to manage aggression in dementia patients. Um, all topics that are really hot. Uh, the, what are the distinctive features of this program? Well. They're listed here. Uh, I'm going to go through them because uh, it's the most interesting stuff. The crucial thing is an ongoing partnership with key players. We don't just do the research, send it out to them, say, you'll find this interesting. Tell us what you think. We actually develop the topics with them. We work with them on a regular basis, meet with them on a schedule. They know they're going to have to do stuff for us and with us. It's an ongoing partnership. We have, in addition, detailed and intensive involvement of the partners. Knowledge translation, knowledge transfer, knowledge exchange, whatever the term is these days, works better when the research users are involved in the whole process. They don't just get it at the end. They help formulate the question. And in our case, they actually come up with the questions. They help shape the question so it's researchable. They sit on the research team, including the Deputy Minister of Health, one project out of four or five. Uh, they review the reports, they edit it, they make suggestions, then they attend the sessions at which we do the release. They are fully involved. Uh, the third key feature is that it focuses on urgent questions. It's not pie in the sky questions. It's stuff they need to know in the, within the next 9 to 12 months because they're going to have to make a decision. We use national experts as the scientific lead so that nobody can say, well, you know, that's so-and-so's cousin and he's related to the deputy minister so you can't take it seriously. They're external experts. Um, we use respected scientific methods largely uh, modeled on a phenomenon called the Cochrane Collaboration, which is the most sophisticated system in the world for uh, reviewing and synthesizing health scientific evidence. We have a relatively quick turnaround, that is six to seven months for the big reports. But what we discovered is that one, six to seven months would often drift out into eight or nine, and often eight or nine was too long, they already had to make the decision, uh, so we came up with this short version, the 30-day version. Uh, 
the key is contextualization. The question is not what works, but what is likely to work here, right here, right now. And then we take great care and spend a considerable amount of money getting the report into the hands of people who actually make the key decisions. Does it work? Well, to a limited extent, it actually does. So what I'm suggesting is that in health policy, for a variety of reasons, and here for another variety of reasons, and at least for the moment, uh, there are ways of getting evidence into decision making uh, that can work some of the time. Uh, I think Peter is right in general, but I think I'm right in the specific. Um, we've got the senior executives of the healthcare system actually paying attention. So I send out an email uh, with a read receipt, and the read receipts come back. They open my email. This is a miracle all in itself. <laughs> Try that in Ontario with the deputy minister. Well, maybe because uh, we know him. But uh, in general, a researcher in a little research unit sending an email to the deputy minister of health uh, is not going to get his email read. It'll be read by somebody way down the chain three weeks from when it comes in. Uh, uh, they're continuing to fund us. Our funding comes from the Department of Health. They've slashed the hell out of our budget, but they kept intact the part of our budget that does this program. Uh, the senior executives not only pay attention, they actually participate. So as I said, each of our teams has either a regional health authority CEO or the deputy minister of health on the team, and they actually participate. They put in the time, they show up at the meetings, they participate in the video conferences and the conference calls, they review the documents, they make suggestions in the margin using track changes. They're actually paying attention. Uh, the involvement also penetrates in those organizations below the level of the chief honcho, uh, considerably further down in the system, partly because we created a group of people in each organization that we call crisp champions. I resisted this term for a long time because it sounded like a breakfast cereal commercial. <laughs> uh, but I finally bought it because everybody else liked it. So each, or, each of these five organizations has, in addition to the CEO, four or five other people who play with us, who participate in our projects, who help formulate the questions, who edit the reports, etc. cetera. Uh, the other thing that has happened, uh, and the G at the end of that word is uh, not intentional. Uh, we've, we've developed a system that produced bilateral learning. That is, uh, it's clear that policymakers and researchers have trouble talking to each other. And what we discovered at the beginning is we had trouble explaining to them what we wanted to do, and they had trouble doing what we were asking. They had trouble formulating researchable questions so we would either get dead silence from a CEO, who's there, or we'd get these huge laundry lists of possible topics, uh, most of which were not researchable. Uh, over the course of a couple of years, we've learned how to talk to them better, better, and they've learned how to talk to us and how to formulate questions that are actually subject to scientific research. And most important, we have actually had some influence on actual policy decisions. Uh, if we went through that list of topics we've already done, I would say about 40% of them have produced real policy change. I'll give you an example. Uh, rural dialysis, the first study we ever did. Uh, before we did it, every time that a rural community would scream and yell that it was too far for the people who had kidney failure in their region to drive to the hospital, wherever, how far it was away, to get dialysis, and they needed a local dialysis center, the government said, okay, fine, terrific, we'll do it. Uh, but they wanted to know whether that was scientifically a good idea. We told them it wasn't. We produced a template for decision making about how they should decide what was too far and how many people you needed, who needed dialysis to make it worth doing, and what else they could do. And they now use that template 
every time they get a request to establish a satellite dialysis center. PET scan. This is an interesting story I told you last night. Uh, we were asked by, by this team of five to do a study of whether the province needed its own PET scan. Most other provinces had one. Uh, there was a lot of pressure to get what is the Cadillac of diagnostic imaging technologies that cost about $5 million to install and a million dollars a year to run. So they're very expensive. They do stuff that other technologies can't. Uh, so the question was, should a small, not particularly rich province like Newfoundland buy one of these things and maintain it? Uh, so we were gearing up to do the research when uh, the Premier at the time, whose picture you've seen up there before, uh, simply got up and said, we're buying one. He did a press interview and said, we're buying a pet scanner. So we had to, uh, we were actually too topical. Uh, so we had to rejig the question to say, if you're buying a pet scanner, what do you need to know? And it turns out what they need to know is they also needed to buy for another $5 million and install for another $2 million and maintain for another $500,000 a year and staff for another $500,000 a year a cyclotron that would produce the nuclear tracers that were necessary for the operation of this PET scanner. They had no idea. Neither did I before our team did the research. So they already committed to spending $5 million plus, plus, plus a year. It became $10 million plus, plus a year, but they're doing it. But at the very least, while they went into the process of setting it up, they used our instructions from our report about what they needed to know, who they needed to hire, where they needed to get the training, what the costs were likely to be, and how they could avoid the worst scenarios. Uh, there are a bunch of, excuse me, others. Uh, I won't uh, bother you with the details. Let me give you one general one. Uh, in the process of developing this technique for contextualizing scientific findings, we develop a template of the kinds of contextual factors that need to be taken into consideration when making these decisions. Our partners in the system now use this framework when they're making their own decisions. At level, a couple of levels down, a policy analyst or somebody else doubling as a policy analyst, because Peter's right, there aren't many pure policy analysts left in government, even in health, uh, will use our template when writing a briefing note for the assistant deputy minister about some issue that's come up. Uh, that I take to be what uh, one of the experts in knowledge translation, a guy named John Levis at McMaster, calls tacit knowledge transfer. This is transferring a mode of knowing things rather than some concrete substance of knowledge to decision making. They use your language, they use a language they didn't use before, and they use a way of finding things out, a tool that they hadn't had before. So we've had, I think, a certain amount of influence. Now, half of our reports go uh, ignored, or they don't do anything about it. Occasionally they do the opposite of what we recommend, but they are paying attention, and I would say four times out of ten, they actually do what we suggest they do, or avoid doing what we suggest they don't do. Why has it worked? Well, some of it is just luck. As I said before, there used to be 15 organizations we had to deal with. There was the Department of Health, and then there were 14 regional health departments. Trying to do this process of consultation, intensive, to and fro cyclical consultation about picking topics with 15 senior officials would be hell. Once you're down to five, it's actually manageable. And what happened while we were gearing up for this program, they consolidated the regional health authorities from 14 to four. To four. So I only have to deal with five of them now. And I predict there are gonna be one, there will be one very soon, or maybe two. Uh, was that two to suggest there are going to be two or two that I have two minutes? Yeah, you have two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Um, uh, the second point is leadership capacity. Uh, there are some of these senior officials who actually have, in those five top positions, 
who actually have higher degrees, including PhDs. They can talk to us. They can hear us. They can talk back. Um, the focus on immediate, urgent issues makes this work. The focus on their questions and not ours is the most important thing. It's their questions. I don't go to them and say, you know, you should let us do research on this topic because it's really interesting. I, I, I could do that, but I don't because it uh, backfires. I let them make the suggestions. The other issue, and I think this is why it works in health and might not work in other policy fields, is health research actually has a kind of scientific credibility. It's science. Uh, they have to believe it. I think it also works because it's health and they're spending 40 to 45 percent of their budgets on it. And one, they believe the science can save them money. And two, they uh, really need to save money. They're in big trouble. Uh, the key, as I say, is contextualization. It's that we're giving them research that speaks to them. The question is their question tailored to what they need to try to figure out. And the answers are answers that are shaped, that are made to measure for them, for Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, would it work elsewhere? I'm not sure. I don't have time. We can talk about that later. I'll just mention that we're now in the process of trying to get funding to do an experiment, which is change fields with this technology, to move it from one aspect of health, which is health policy, health technology decisions, into occupational health and safety which is another hat that I wear. And to try to figure out whether this method will work in that other field. There are reasons to think it won't and reasons to think it might. Uh, uh, could it work in other provinces? Perhaps this experiment that we're going to try to get funding will try to work in Manitoba, because the money is from Manitoba. So we will see. So all I'm saying is I think that we've stumbled on something that in one context, in one policy area, actually does work some of the time to influence <laughs> policy, and uh, that is in some ways a miracle. Thank you.